Today, we're going to be talking about financial reporting for startups. This is such a difficult activity for so many startups, but we've got some true experts here who can really give us the lowdown on this. Today, we're joined with Craig Fryer, who is our Chief Operating Officer and EVP of Data at Fundify. Craig um, has, is a former venture partner and an active angel investor. He has personally vetted more than 3,000 startups and has held executive roles with multiple startups as well as public corporations across a, a wide range of tech. So um, Craig is uh, well-versed in this subject. Welcome, Craig. Thank you. We, we also have Ben Kromnik, our Vice President of Startups at Fundify. Ben has a strong background in building digital products as a startup founder and leader. Um, so he has been in your shoes and he's experienced with as a family office investor and also an angel investor. He currently leads our startup success team here at Fundify, where he talks with a wide variety of startups and helps them um, determine if equity crowdfunding is the right approach for them. And if so, he helps them get ready, including um, you know talking them through what's needed on the financial reporting side. So welcome, Ben. And our special guest speaker today is Taylor Davidson. Uh, we're so fortunate to have Taylor with us today. Taylor is a financial modeling expert. He founded a company called Foresight.is, which is a platform that simplifies financial forecasting for startups and has been used for by 35,000 people from 116 countries since 2008. Taylor is a former New York City-based venture capitalist and a private equity analyst who has been building financial models for startups for two decades. So we are so happy to have Taylor here and, and um, grateful for Taylor's willingness to share his insights. Um, so with those intros, I'm gonna turn it over to Craig and the rest of them. Thanks very much, Amy. And again, I wanna add my welcome to those who are joining us on today's live stream. So uh, Taylor is, uh, it, it's always interesting when I see this picture of you, Taylor, because it reminds me of my response to financial forecasting, which is I just kind of scratch my head and go, I wish somebody could help me with this, right? So that's a common, and so I, it's a very endearing photo when I, when I think about this area of financial reporting. And so in the area of regulation equity crowdfunding, there are a specific but reduced set of financial reporting requirements that the SEC is asking for. Now, the cool thing about equity crowdfunding, if you're not familiar, it's a little different than maybe a venture capital series raise or an angel round or an IPO or um, a PPM that you might prepare uh, for a roadshow or even a, an ICO. So it's it's different. It's, as we often describe uh, equity crowdfunding, with the example, it's like Kickstarter, instead of a product or service that you get in exchange for an investment, in equity crowdfunding, you actually get security in the company. You, you own a piece of the company, you own stock in the company. So the upside of that over a product or service could be substantial. And so um, that's the, the reason that equity crowdfunding is growing at about 140% year over year this year. It's exploding and Fundify launched this summer and we have a, a wide range of companies that you can find in our marketplace to invest in as little as $10. So this used to be just the realm and domain for accredited investors, the high net worth, wealthy individuals. Now we, through our platform, have provided access for all. So anybody can invest in a number of these startups from energy to healthcare to entertainment. I mean, there's a broad swath of companies there. And in regards to financial reporting, what the SEC requires when you raise money under equity crowdfunding is a gap compliant and, and Taylor, I'll let you define GAP when we get there in a moment. GAP compliant reports in support of your crowdfunding campaign, it's called an offering to use the parlance or a crowdfunding raise. And that depends on the amount of, de of, of information and detail that you go into in your financial disclosure, it depends on how much you're raising and the stage of the company, if you've ever raised uh, before or not. And we simplify that quite a bit in how we do things at, at, at Fundify. In fact, our motto is to simplify startup funding. As Amy said, I've been involved in venture funding and angel funding for quite some time, and it's still very challenging. So the cool thing about the platform, Ben's team and partners like Taylor and the guys at Foresight, the team at Foresight is we're helping to further simplify that and make it clear. Here's an example of one of the companies that actually did a successful crowdfunding raise they raised 300% of their target this summer and was our first company out of the gate. 
these are the gap financials that they disclosed. And it's an early stage company with some revenue. And so they could use this self-disclosure form uh, that they file on something called Edgar. Edgar is an online document filing system at the SEC. And so there were basically in this gap financial disclosure, four different pages, a self-attestation page, a balance sheet, an income statement, a statement of cash flows, and their statements of change in stockholder equity. So this is actually a template that we provide to you uh, on our website. So if you don't have a background in this and you need a template to work from, we've taken the time to do that. In fact, going to our website, if you open up a campaign and you wanna do a crowdfunding raise, one of the things you do is we onboard you and provide you with all the information you need to upload, including the financials. And we have all this information about what's required here, including this template that I just showed to you. Also, Amy's developed an incredibly encyclopedic knowledge base that goes in and talks about the details of what's required. So depending on the amount of money that you're raising in your equity crowdfunding campaign, it could be self-certified by the principal executive, or if it's in a certain bracket, it will be need it will, it will need to be reviewed by a public independent public accountant. You can raise now up to five million dollars in an equity crowdfunding campaign. That was a new law that raised it from a million seventy thousand to five million earlier this year, and that's the case going forward. So if it's in certain higher brackets, there may be other review requirements depending on if you've done this before. It'll either need to be reviewed by an independent accountant or audited by an independent accountant. So we can walk you through these various requirements and help point you to partners that can help with this uh, in terms of audits and reviews. And in the case of today, this whole area of financial reporting and how this can be augmented by the, the tools that, that Foresight has available. So with that, I'd like to uh, give uh, a little bit of a brief overview of Again, what's required in the forecasting, you have to talk about the minimum and the maximum target for your campaign. You have to give some idea of where things are going in your forecast. Uh, it's great that if, if you can calculate a term called burn rate and runway, and I'll invite Taylor to, to define those as well, and then forecast for other components of that. So with that, uh, Taylor, I'm actually giving you remote control there. You should see it on your screen. You can click in and start advancing the, uh, the mouse there on your side. So please take us through and introduce us to Foresight and your forecasting model there. And thanks again for being a part of today's live stream. Oh, sure. Happy to join. It's going to be really kind of really fun to go through the topic. And again, like financial forecasting and doing financial projections is not typically like a very fun process. And it's typically fairly, fairly opaque in terms of how it's handled. And I think it's really great to have kind of new platforms and information to make the process um, as easy as it can be for people because it can be a fairly complicated thing to do. So I want to talk about a couple of things. Let's see. So how do we, how do I advance? Advance. Perfect. So um, in the, in the concept of financial forecasting, there's a couple like key concepts to remember. And I'm going to try and go through a couple like key concepts to remember in general, like general principles in terms of when creating a financial forecast. Um, Create a financial forecast, any platform you want to, whether it's a web app or Excel or spreadsheets, there's a number of platforms out there you can use to create financial forecasts today. One of the first things you're gonna have to think about when you create this is like, okay, what kind of time scope do I need? So Craig talked earlier before about uh, demonstrating like a funding target or like a min and max. And generally what we're gonna try and do when we create a forecast is create an idea of like, okay, how long is that? How long do I need to forecast against the funds I'm looking to raise? The whole point of a forecast usually is to convince somebody that, that the business you're growing can be huge uh, and that you have sufficient uh, planning and detail built into your plans to demonstrate you can execute to achieve that large, that, that scale you can grow your company, given the funds that you're raising. So growth potential given with being deploying the capital you're raising across a number of expense items. So part of that area becomes how do you create like a time scale to kind of show that? Do I need to do a forecast for one year, three years, or five years? There's general conventions in terms of uh, what the appropriate time scale is out there. Oftentimes people, investors will ask you for five years. 
doing a five-year forecast is really, really hard. It's really hard to kind of forecast something that deep in the future. And oftentimes you don't need to do a five-year forecast to really show that you're going to be a big business. So oftentimes three years becomes a kind of an intermediate kind of scope to, to use for that. What I generally prescribe is that we have to create a forecast that covers an appropriate time period to show at least like the, the deployment of capital, the funds you're raising, and then some growth after that to kind of show where there's kind of additional kind of growth opportunities for. And so the longer scale, we, the longer end we get to a forecast, like the less detail it needs to be. The more near term it gets over the, the near term deployment of capital, the more detailed it has to get in the items that you want to show as part of the forecast. Now, uh, um, now, going into like uh, the scope of like forecasters, a general way to think about creating a revenue forecast, and it goes into kind of how you do financial or operational forecasts, right? So the general idea is, hey, there's um there's a level of detail you can use to build new to do forecasting. There's innumerable ways to forecast revenues, uh, innumerable ways to kind of forecast the growth of the companies. The key thing is really to use a structure and a way of thinking about your business and create a forecast that allows you to use that almost like that equation underlying your business, like kind of that, that base understanding of your business and use that as a kind of the method of forecasting it. And so, you know, all that comes from like your goal, like what is the goal, the point of creating a forecast? Oftentimes we want to create a financial forecast, like revenues, profits, those sort of things. But we also want to have some level of operational details behind it customers, orders, those sort of things. And so understanding the trade-offs, the level, right level of complexity in there is just an important component to this. So on the financial side, typically what we'll do is we will want to, we want to uh, forecast revenues, right? And so it's often like, the easiest way to do this. And with more like very mature businesses, typically you'll take a, a for a very mature public company or for a late stage growth company, like the way you'll do a forecast is based off revenues, right? You'll say, hey, I, I, there's a certain, we looked at the past to say, hey, here's been past revenue growth. Here's the, the, the current revenues and forecast growth based on like a percentage of growth or new per period. Um, or you know, tie it to like MRR, say, hey, here's our current MRR and here's the new MRR we're added per period or new ARR we're added per period, whatever the method is, and just create a schedule of like forecast revenue from there. And for many purposes, that works, right? If that's a level of detail that works for you or is necessary for you, is necessary for your kind of goal, that works. The key to understanding there is uh, a pure revenue-based forecasting doesn't provide a lot of operational details uh, about what, how that revenue actually occurs to satisfy like real tactical planning around what you're actually going to do in the business. And so that's where it comes to like operational forecast becomes really valuable where you can um, operational forecast become really valuable and allowing you to detail the actually what's actually uh, underlying that growth in revenues. So the way that the operational forecast works is you're going to forecast out some like a core business events and those business events are going to drive that forecast. Now business events could be, you know, orders if you're an e-commerce company, it could be clients if you're a, a services company, it can be subscriptions if you're a, you're a, a SaaS based company. Um, and you're going to forecast out some idea of like, total total subscribers or total customers or orders and then usually some idea of like churn or retention or repeat to kind of show kind of how it kind of works and so and then uh, understanding of average revenue per customer or the different average revenue per order or the different kind of components of revenue you have and therefore detailing out the idea of you know how you're kind of growing customers and subscribers and these over time and how the results in averages it, Average revenues, it enables you to have more insightful conversations around the business and be able to think about revenues. It's really hard to look at a revenue forecast and be like, I think we're going to hit 5 million, 5 million ARR in, in year two or whatever. It's really hard to have an insightful question uh, or insightful like scope of thinking or planning around that if you don't understand how that actually happened. Okay, well, how many customers do I need to acquire? What do I think I can charge based upon the market or competitors? What is a uh, number of customers I think I can acquire? What do I have to do to 
Think in terms of churn rates to keep acquiring new customers, reach that. What do I have to fund and invest in terms of growth to reach those forecasts? And so by, by detailing out more details to a kind of operational forecast drive revenue, it just enables you to have so much uh, richer conversations with potential investors and stakeholders and people who are looking to kind of review your plans as well because it provides so much for benchmarks. One of the core, one of the problems in, in most cases around financial forecasts is people say like, oh, models are always wrong or or they'll look at a financial forecast of a five-year or a revenue projection and they'll just take some arbitrary number to cut off half of the revenues or whatever. And the reason that happens is because people don't have like a lot of visibility to what they're actually doing. It's like, okay, what does it actually mean? How can I, how can I benchmark that, that, that revenue number you're forecasting? How can I think of that in more concrete terms? And so using an operation of forecast is usually kind of a key part of that. There's also this idea of creating range forecasts, like a point estimate and a, and a range forecast. And the, the core difference here is that a point for estimate is I'm saying, I think, I think there's also gonna be one number. Um, and that can be really hard, right? If you're kind of forecast growth, it's like, how do I choose what my growth rate's gonna be? How do I choose what ARR I'm gonna hit in year two or whatever? And that can be a really, really hard thing to do. So instead we do tend to do like range-based forecasts, right? Range meaning, well, maybe I don't know my, my right, number of average revenue per is going to be, but I know like what it could be between, I don't know if it's going to be $10, whatever, but I think it'd be between five and 15, right? Or perhaps I don't know what my growth rate is in terms of number of customers I'm going to reach, but I may say, well, I think it's going to be between X and Y. And what we do that is we create these almost like scenarios uh, for, you know, me low, medium, high, or these range-based forecasts. And we create these scenario-based forecasts because it enables you to think, okay, well, how does the business vary depending upon how the scenario works. And so tactically, it will create, usually create a forecast and then do some, some method to use scenario planning or create multiple models to kind of understand how the business flexes or changes based upon accomplishment of the minimum of all these variables, the maximum of all these variables and kind of how it achieves within there. And then create different plans against that. So we have thought about where the growth kind of comes from throughout. Now, when we we're focusing on like the forecast, one of the key things that we do is to kind of break down into like revenue forecasting and expense forecasting. Most of what we talked about so far is revenue forecasting. So expense forecasting is often like easier, right? Well, not easier in the sense that it's easier to do in a more detailed manner. And it's also often much more controllable for by an operator. Hard things of creating revenue forecasts is you don't really know. And in any case, you don't have the ability to control like how many customers you're going to, subscribers are going to be, or retention rates are going to be. You can't really control it. You have to launch something and see what the market kind of, kind of shows. But expenses, in a large part, most of your expenses, you actually have much more uh, executional ability to control what those expenses are. And so creating an expense, an expense forecast for those items is a usually more meaningful or more important first part of the forecast to create because you're going to, you're going to have a lot more ability to control them. And it's such a you know, how you detail and uh, set your set of your potential expenses over time. It's like, it's like communicating your strategy. Like what's important to you? Are you spending money to growth? Are you spending money to product development? Are you budgeting for growth? It, it shows how you're thinking about the right way to grow the business using the funds that you're raising. And so it becomes an important, like a really like an important part in, you know, in providing color and reflecting the strategy that you have to kind of grow your business. Now, one of the key components to an expense forecast is really around hiring. Most startups we're doing, the, the money we spend on salaries and people is by far the, the largest kind of component of expenses. And so oftentimes when you create an expense forecast, the hiring plan or a schedule of potential hires becomes the most important part. And typically the best way to do this is just use like one row in a spreadsheet per person and say, hey, here's the individual people or types of people that I'm looking to hire what my potential salaries will be, when I'm expecting to hire them, to create a schedule of potential hires, especially over the next you know, year, for example. And that is such an indication of strategy, like when you plan on hiring a marketing person, when you plan on hire a CTO or a COO or finance people, whatever, it shows how you, how you actually think or what's important for you to do to kind of grow your business. And so a hiring plan is this like base level of, of tactical planning that is really like valuable for you in planning and budgeting for your costs, but also under like communicating your strategy. Now, 
it's easy to let to create a hiring plan for you know a short term, meaning you know say twelve to twenty four months. Beyond that, it can be really hard to do that on a per you know per person basis when you get to really start to scale a company. So tactically, usually what what you want to do in a forecast is you know create your detailed hires for the short term and the long term. Just assume hires based on some other metric, like you're going to spend. X percentage of your revenue on customer support or X percentage of growth on, on your revenues on salespeople, for example, or you're going to have to hire a certain number of customer support people per number of customers or subscribers or whatever it is. And then use these operational, those business events, use those as drivers for your, your spend on hires kind of after that. So it's an important part to like understand that you can do things in different level of details, depending upon that, that time scale against it. Now, Craig talked about before about like burn and runway, right? And typically burn is refers to basically the cash you, you have to spend around the business. And so we can think of that typically in terms of like gross burn and net. Gross is just like total expenses. Net is usually net of revenues. And so, you know, the reason why we do, we have a metric like burn is just to understand, okay, well, how much money I'm actually spending each month. And that becomes valuable when thinking about in terms of runway, which is basically like, okay, well, how long can this business run given the amount I'm spending each month and how much cash I actually have on hand? And so runway is typically expressed in terms of number of months, and it's just cash on cash balance on hand divided by uh, burn. Now, obviously, it can be more complex. Your burn will probably change over time. Your cash position will change over time. When you factor in revenues, it changes how you think about burn. But being able to think about, okay, well, how much, like in really tactical terms, how much money am I paying out each month for everything I'm doing? Uh, what is my base level under, of expectations in terms of how much money I need to make to cover the expenses I have? And how long can I continue to exist as a business to, to achieve the goals that I have to reach that next round of funding or reach cash flow profitability, whatever it is. Understanding the scope of, 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 um, of burn and then time becomes a really important part to show that you understand your strategy and show that you've planned appropriately to achieve the goals you need to. The, the way it typically you know, gets constructed in terms of like the typical like idea of like venture financing is, you know, companies need to raise enough money to be able to achieve enough goals, but to raise the next round, for example. So if you plan a fundraising that only gives you six months to you have to raise your next round, it could be very difficult because you probably won't be able to raise the money and accomplish enough things and convince enough people to put in more money before you actually run out of money. So you have to plan for that timeline appropriately for it. And where this typically comes into play is, is that it's just thinking around sources and uses. Now, sources and uses is a complicated term. Uh, it really describes a simple thing. Sources is just like where you're getting money. Uses is where you're spending so typically what you'll, you'll do in some form of financial kind of report is you have a table or a chart and it'll detail out the sources of funds, usually external funding or fundraising or working capital, whatever. And then uses of funds, meaning salaries, people, development expenses, purchasing inventory, like whatever these kind of items, these items are, this necessary part of it. And uh, the sources and uses is typically created to show like, hey, there's a specific round of funding that I'm raising. And then here's how I'm going to spend it all over some time, some time period. Um, and it's uh, usually a core part of a financial forecast to kind of provide a quick summary of how of your strategy in terms of how you're planning to spend money. Um, so the, uh, the kind of last kind of uh, uh, important topic around this idea is that we create forecasts for a reason. Right? We create forecasts because we're trying to create a plan. And then once you start executing against that plan, then it comes time to actually kind of use it. Right? Oftentimes people will build a model for a purpose. And the purpose is like somebody else is asking them for a model. Like we have to build it for a fundraising event. We have to build it because an investor asked for it. We have to build it to, to show how we're going to spend money. And then we may not use it in our actual kind of data interactions in terms of running a company. But that's actually where it becomes really valuable. Right? So if you create a forecast, and then kind of constantly review the forecast you created against what's actually happening. Like once you actually start executing the business and running it, using your accounting software or whatever to see what's actually happening in your business, tracking back to your forecast enables you to understand, okay, well, how have I, how have I, uh, how have evolved my thinking of the business? How have I accomplished against that? And there are simple ways to do that and complicated ways to do that. There are expensive ways to do that and inexpensive ways to do that. My, my net ed is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of tools and things out there to help you understand this, to help you understand financials and that. There's a lot of emerging uh, platforms out there for 
understanding your financials, uh, whether you use a web app or a spreadsheet or whatever it is, um, there's a lot of tools out there to kind of help you understand this. You can outsource it entirely to CFOs and people do for you. I think there's also a lot of value in you understanding yourself at a base level before depending upon someone else to take out it for you. So the, the important thing is just that there is the, the, the forecast you created is a valuable part of planning for the next event. And so the, you can use your ongoing financials and results from them to continue to review and kind of update your view of, of the future as well. Um, this might be a really, now, now you might, this might be a good time to break for questions. Yes, thanks so much. Excellent, excellent overview and really appreciate that. So I'm going to ask Ben to kick us off with some questions. And then also, uh, Amy, if you could look for and collect questions in chat, uh, folks, please uh, take this uh, opportunity to type in a question that you might have, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So Ben, please kick us off, sir. Sure. Um, so a question we get all the time from startups is, how are they actually able to tell a enticing attractive financial story while maintaining compliance within crowdfunding, right? So you, you there's a, a bit of a, a boundary between you cannot make forward-looking unsubstantiated statements about your growth, but you also want to be able to forecast your growth and demonstrate that as part of your, uh, as, as part of your crowdfunding campaign and part of your disclosure. I love if you can talk about how companies often walk that line. That's a great question for Craig. Great, Craig, go for it. <laughs> Um, well, um, it seems like there, I mean, Ben, share, share your thoughts to kick it off because you asked the question, you've got an, uh, an idea about that. So, and then I'll color commentary on it. Sure. Um, so one of the things you, you, you often companies want to say is next year, we're going to sell $10 million in subscription licensing or in product sales. Um, and in crowdfunding, that's a prohibited statement. Um, However, you can absolutely say, we expect to be doing these things to sell products. We expect the market to grow in certain ways. So very often we recommend companies uh, talk about market growth, talk about the size of the opportunity, um, and then talk about what they're doing to actually go capture that value um, without saying, we're gonna have $10 million in sales next year, because you actually can't say that. So um, that's a, a little bit of the, the, the initial underlying premise. Uh, Craig, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, and, and the SEC and, and their oversight group called FINRA, the Financial Re Regulatory uh, Auditing, I believe is what it stands for. I can't remember what FINRA stands for exactly. But anyway, they have a series, a litany of words that they use of, of misleading, a promissory, uh, and, and so forth. And you don't want to ever fall into those buckets. So uh, talking about facts is the safest way to go when you're talking about forecasting in the context of potential revenues. And so Ben Ben covered off on that. We can help coach you into that as well. But using external uh, industries, surveys, stats, what comes to mind immediately is uh, Statista or Reuters or PitchBook or others. There's a number of companies out there, Gartner, that can give you some really good information on your particular industry sector. The other thing that, Taylor, you've probably seen this before. I've seen it a lot in startups is, is the proclivity to forecast against a big number in the industry to say my startup only wants to capture 1% of a billion dollar industry. Well, you know, my response is who wouldn't, <laughs> I mean, right. And so you have to do the heavier lift of building your forecast from the ground up. It's like, what's the market up total available market? What's your market opportunity? What pain are you going to address in the market? Is it, as I've often asked, is it a vitamin or an aspirin in terms of your solution? And then what's it gonna cost? How do you get to the customers? What does that cost? And what's your then growth rate projections? And building that bottoms up forecast is a heavier lift than just throwing a dart at a board and saying X percent of a big market. Um, so that's a challenge often because startup founders may or may not know how to do that modeling. So talk to us a bit about how your tool and your runway forecast can help with that. Yeah, I mean, so everything, so that's a good addition to what we talked about before. I mean, uh, the, what, you're, what you're alluding to is this the difference between tops down forecasting and bottoms up forecasting. And everything I shared earlier on was, was around from the premise of bottoms up forecasting. You know, tops down is, is basically, as you said, is 
hey, I have a certain market size opportunity I'm selling into. And we'll use that, that big number as a, as a justification or as a way to convince whoever we're trying to convince that there's a big market opportunity we're chasing. The problem with that, with using a, a pure top-down approach is that, you know, one, it doesn't even provide any operational insights and in what you have to actually do to achieve that percentage of the marketplace. Two is that that idea of a hey, capture a certain percentage of the, mar- of the market, you know, typically when you do that, they'll pick a really large addressable market against that. But like, you know, really, it's not really all addressable. Like you can't actually target that many customers. There's usually a couple of slivers underneath that. And we'll, we'll think of it in terms of TAM, SAM, SOM, these kind of various terms is to, do, to take that big addressable market and pull it down to something that's like smaller and more, uh, and more uh, approachable or more actually like achievable. But even, even if you take that approach, that's good to use as a benchmark. It's not good to use as, a, as an actual method of forecasting. It's good to create a bottoms up forecast and then provide a validation and say, okay, well, if I actually accomplish these revenue numbers, what does that mean in terms of my percentage of the overall market that I'm capturing as a way to kind of validate the approach to it? You know, but the bottoms up approach kind of along the, the lines I talked about before is a more meaningful way for you to actually kind of create a plan against it. And this does talk back to the point of like, you know, Ben's actual thing of, you know, we talk like the idea of like facts, right? So it's really hard to find facts around how many units you're going to sell and sell in the future. And it's much easier to find facts around projected market size or market market opportunity out there. So, you know, it can be, it can be harder to find um, uh, good data against it. But the bottoms of approach is going to be a much more like a meaningful way to create forecasts that you can use. That's great. And, and I know this in venture capital, what happens often is they take your forecast and they, if they're interested in your company, they toss it over to one of their associates, typically uh, one of their junior associates uh, with a fintech or finance background economics, and they'll run the numbers and see if if you have any any basis of reality. And the thing, comment on this, the thing that I've often said to startups is your forecast is intended to give an investor, especially in equity crowdfunding, which equity crowdfunding is a different target market. We're looking at what the SEC refers to as an average reasonable investor. This is a retail investor that may invest some money in a 401k, or maybe they've tried their hand at Robinhood or Acorns or something else in terms of investing in the markets, but they're not sophisticated investors. So you have to give them forecasting information that they can digest and they can understand. But here's the key, here's the point I'm getting to, I love your comment on. What oftentimes people care about is your assumption set that builds your forecast. Do you know the business well enough that you can tease out the different parts and pieces, whether it's inventory or production or you know, uh, cost of customer acquisition or things that uh, are, are the underpinnings of your model that help people understand, hey, this person really gets it. They understand what the dynamics are. Yeah, so assumptions have become a really important part because it shows that you understand, like, even if you don't know the actual numbers, you know, that are, that are specific for your business, like, you've done the appropriate research to understand what's accomplishable or potential in your business. And it's important, you know, usually when you want to communicate a model, when you want to structure a model, it's important, like, tactically just to, like, separate out key inputs from financials. You know, good financial structure is usually separating out uh, inputs, calculation, and presentation. So we show, like, three different, so that you have an input so someone can quickly understand, hey, what are the key inputs being used? calculations, you can see the calculations are, and then presentation of the key inputs in terms of like tables and charts, right? So that way people can like understand the inputs and then understand the outputs, not necessarily worry about all the calculations. The more that you merge those things together, the harder it becomes you to actually like actually use your model, yeah. but then actually communicate it as well when you're trying to share with people. But yeah, I mean, you know, the the, uh, the idea of assumptions becomes especially important when you, when you around this idea of like range forecasting, like we talked before, is that, uh, Oftentimes what you'll, you'll do is you'll make your assumptions and then you want to see what happens to your model, your business, if your assumptions are different from what you expect, or if, if you surface the assumptions in a way that someone can actually kind of use them, use them and understand them, then they can say, well, like based on my understanding of the market, I think this is more applicable. And they can see how your business changes upon that. And then you can have a conversation in terms of uh, what, the, what appropriate assumptions you think are, what the range of assumptions are, and if the full impact it has on the business from them. And that's what I like about your runway model, Taylor, is 
it has those assumptions separated out so people can, you know, really show those inputs. I built a model years ago around a fictional company, Nuco, and I had a tab that said assumptions. So um, it's uh, it's really helpful to, as, as opposed to putting those baked into the formulas where you have to go in and kind of locate those assumptions. It makes it a lot harder. So that's really great. I think Ben has another question, and then we'll look to Amy to see if there are any questions from the audience. If you've not posed a question yet, please uh, pop in the chat and let us know if there's anything you'd like to hear from Taylor about with regards to financial forecasting. Sure. So Taylor, one of the most common questions we get um, is, you know, is my valuation correct? And is this a good valuation? You know, is this going to be the valuation that's, that I'm going to raise the money on? Um, I would love if you can talk a little bit about how does financial forecasting and reporting um, interact with your valuation and they are not exactly the same, but they should, they do have a lot of, con of con connectivity there. I'd love if you can talk about that relationship. There's, there's an art and a science to valuation. The science is really easy to apply. The art is really hard, especially for someone who doesn't do valuations all the time. Valuations basically. So the more mature a company is, the more, uh, the more you can use a forecast or a set of, the set of actual known data to create, a, to create a valuation. And typically you're gonna create a valuation either using a multiple, like a multiple of earnings or, or EBITDA or, or, or revenues, and they're based upon some comparison of other companies out, out of the market, or you use a methodology called discounted cash flow analysis, which is basically just saying, hey, of the, of the money I, that I'm projecting to earn in the future, what's that worth today? And there's a fairly standard way to apply that methodology to, to calculate valuations. Now, the hard part about that is that if you're trying to forecast something that doesn't exist and your forecasts are effectively like highly subjective, traditional valuation math like that doesn't really apply to the same degree. It's, it's not as valuable and you can't really apply it. You can't really use it as a justification for most people as part of a valuation conversation. So oftentimes valuation here kind of strays away from like a, a, like a pure financial forecast and into understanding like market conditions. You know, people are going to like looking, most companies when they're looking to raise money, they're looking to sell a certain percentage of the company. And so the amount of money they're looking to raise and the percentage of the company they're selling becomes the valuation in effect. And there are market norms for companies at a moment in time, given their industry or growth or executives or whatever uh, characteristics you can use to demonstrate to show uh, traction and future potential, there tends to be a marketplace out there for what the right valuation for that is. And kind of what you can hear in that, in that, 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 that commentary there is the less mature you are, the more you have to use other methods of just justifying valuation rather than a pure financial forecast. And so oftentimes you'll do, you know, there are valuation platforms that will do, there's a multiple evaluation methodologies. You could do, there's like scorecard based things, which are very qualitative rather than quantitative. Um, but it becomes more, uh, you have to be more flexible in terms of utilizing different approaches and an understanding of market norms at that moment in time to do uh, to do evaluation that makes sense. So that's where the, the art comes in a lot more than the science that really you get. That makes a lot of sense. One of the things that um, is often the biggest challenge is to say like, well, you know, no one's ever done this before, right? I'm a brand new company, I'm creating a market, you know, I'm, like, I'm, a, I'm gonna be a category creator. Um, it's when invests in you and they give you, they give you money and you go create the thing. And then um, there's a liquidity event. I've actually, I've gone through this personally as an investor multiple times. And when that liquidity event occurs, you have rights as an investor to certain very specific fractions of the company. And there's rather complicated um, both accounting and finance related to how you actually get paid out. Sometimes that results in lawsuits. So, and sometimes those lawsuits um, can be can be based on how did you initially value this thing, and did I really get exactly the right number of shares based on that valuation? And one of the we were just talking yesterday with uh, one of our closest advisors and partners um, about he, he's a he's an expert witness in doing this, um, talking about how you have to be able to prove your assumptions in some fashion. Can you talk about what are some really good um, open source or affordable or, or just generally available 
data sources that you use for startups who are oftentimes trying to find the data for their assumptions to build out that model to, to justify that what might only be your, your series A or your friends and family valuation? Well, I don't know. I guess what I don't know if there are good data, like good data points always to use for your assumptions for evaluation. I, I, I tend to think that like you're the, at, at this kind of stage of funding, your evaluation is not really based upon like your assumptions of like revenues or those sort of things. And it's based much more idea of like the market for, for fundings. And what you're kind of speaking to around like, hey, I've never done this before. Is this like this natural information asymmetry? It's an information asymmetry between like investors who do this all the time. Like they know what other companies, they've seen tons of other companies. They see a lot more fundings. They've done this a bunch more times. They uh, have a gem more, a better appreciation for what the appropriate valuation is for a company at that stage, given the actual market conditions at that time. They do it all the time, they do it every day, as opposed to like a founder who does this like once every, maybe only once or once every so often, some number of years who doesn't necessarily have the same degree of, of uh, accessibility to the information in terms of what the market for fundraising is. I actually think the the way, the, the best fix for that information asymmetry is actually through platforms like you, like working with trusted advisors who can help you guide through that process and you know, help you understand like they have an idea of like the broader market and can provide better inputs into that. It becomes really hard if you're looking to do like evaluation just you know, based purely upon like assumptions of growth or based on other companies, that becomes really, really kind of hard to justify. But I think that, you know, working with partners, uh, working with asking people who, who have a better understanding of the market, talking to lots of other founders who are part of this, there is so much more data, you know, out there around fundraisings and valuations than there used to be. The first startup that I worked for was like 20 years ago. And I can tell you that I ran the fundraising process and that was really hard. Like, you know, you don't, finding investors was hard. Finding information on evaluations was hard. Finding understanding, like understanding the structures it was hard. It wasn't like the same degree of like publicly available information. But nowadays there's so much more uh, commentary around things and so much more accessibility from people who have a lot of experience. Um, and so much more data you can find from PitchBook or CB Insights or you know companies that try to track uh, venture fundings. There's so much more data out there uh, about that that you can use to understand. But at the, at the end of the day, I, I think this is one of those areas where because valuation is more about art than science, talking to people who have an appreciation for the market is usually one of the best ways to get a better feel for you know, whether you're approaching it right. That's a great response. And as I've often told startups, uh, I, I quip that it, it's subject to the golden rule. You know, who has the goal makes the rules. So that asymmetry is exactly what you're talking about. And that is, they actually, the, the venture funds and the institutional investors have access to more expensive premium tools like PitchBook that they can look and see things in your sector. And so it, it does provide that. But Again, if you're trying to raise funds, you, you do what you need to do in terms of that discussion. And the more data you bring to the table, uh, the better. You know, Crunchbase is another one that I've used before that shows some level of information. And interesting, uh, the, the really cool thing about equity crowdfunding, back to what we do, is it's the wisdom of the crowd that actually determine the success of the, of the campaign. So uh, as a funding portal, we're, we're actually restricted from providing financial and other advice to the startups. But what we do instead is, point them to resources that they can go out and take a look at and educate them. We have a, a knowledge base and other materials like this webinar and other things that we use to help. Last question I wanted to talk about um, was back to a, a, a point you made earlier. And that is the value of forecasting to a target point, whether it's forecasting to a milestone or as I've often uh, counseled startups forecasting to revenue. So I, I want to do projections until I get to some level of revenue, maybe profitability, maybe not, but just some level of revenue. Because oftentimes I've told startups, your, your target's too high. You need to raise, to be capital efficient, to be equity conservative, you need to raise as little as you need to achieve that next milestone that increases your valuation. So can you, can you just double click on that a, a little bit further in terms of what you typically uh, advise in terms of forecasting to some future point or milestone. And then we'll wrap up from there. That's a great way to put it. I mean, typically what I want to, typically the, the, the simplest way to think about this is, you know, back to the idea of like a sources and uses of funds. 
you're looking to, you're looking or you're looking to raise money to accomplish something. And so you're usually looking to raise money to like reach run, uh, profitability, like so you can uh, run the business that need to raise external funds, or you're looking to uh, use the funds to get to a certain set of point to achieve a certain set of metrics that investors at that point will want will need to see to raise more external rates of funding. And so you know that's the idea of like a milestone based funding. So like if you have a good idea of what your milestone is for like that next round, then it enables you to kind of come back and. Uh, understand kind of what, how far you need to forecast. For a lot of sense, like the venture world, it tends to be like people will often say like, how much money, you need, how much do you need to raise? And it, how much money you need to raise is usually tied to some idea of time. And because time, because it just takes time to build a company to a certain point to raise more funding. So people will say 12 to 24 months, for example, for funding. And so that's one way to think about it in terms of like a time-based forecast. But that same idea, it, it, it all ties back to the same ideas what do I need to accomplish? Uh, and what is this funding going to allow me to achieve? Whether I think of it in terms of time, milestone, whatever, uh, that enables you to kind of figure out how much you need to raise to accomplish the set of kind of goals that are in front of you. That's great. Thank you, Taylor. Listen, folks on the call, if you've got an idea and you want to raise funds around it, let me give you some encouragement. It is challenging, but the market is, is ripe for doing so. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested in equity crowdfunding, and we're on the fastest pace ever this year since it started just a few years ago. So it's a great time to, to get involved. And if you're interested, um, you can go to Fundify. I'm going to show you our, our homepage, um, and you can join Fundify. It doesn't cost anything to do so. It co there's no obligation as a startup to come and raise funds. We have a success-based model. If you raise, then we have a percentage model of that as part of the success fee. And as an investor, it doesn't cost anything to invest. So whether you're in Ireland or in Idaho, if you have a US-based headquarters, you can raise funds in equity crowdfunding. And one of the cool things that we, and this is actually uh, active campaigns that are going on right now. One of our main premises, as I said earlier, is access for all. As, as little as $10, you can invest in some of the campaigns we have. Then we have another group of, of previews. These are Tesla Water preview campaigns that are preparing to actually go live with their funding campaigns. And we have all of those campaigns down there. You can learn more about us uh, through our FAQs, through our knowledge base. But one thing I wanted to point out here is we also have a number of startup partners, including Foresight, that help you. And so we have pre-negotiated discounts and access to different companies, whether it's pre or post funding, where you can go in and actually uh, take advantage of these, these tools to help equip you for Foresight in particular. You can go to their, their website, and uh, you get 25% off the planning assistance using their services and their introductory model, which we'll go to their site here in just a second, is also available to you. Um, we had one of the people in the in the uh, live stream today mention Zero, and if I'm pronouncing that right, that's another one of our partners here as well. They're using Zero to do their financial modeling and, and management. So uh, we don't do any rev sharing or referral fees for this. This is simply to help you be capital efficient and to do more for less with the capital you raise as part of equity crowdfunding. And so over to the uh, the Foresight uh, webpage, actually I'll just go to your homepage and you can walk us through that. You still have mouse control there, Taylor. Oh, okay, so basically my, my main thing around understanding about forecasts is there's a number of tools out there. Uh, there's a number of web, web apps to build financial forecasts. There's a number of ways to build spreadsheets. And so my goal is really just to provide uh, a set of tools that are an easy way to get started. Uh, the best way to get started with a lot of stuff is basically with this runway and cash tool. It's free. It's used by many companies to create the financials, financial forecasts, financial statements necessary to raise funding. Um, you can download the model. You can edit however you want to. Add in any of your own logic or structures for doing forecast. So it's a very easy kind of way to get started. Um, you can use it to create a full forecast or you can use it as a a base to build your own model as well, or use as a base of a way to think about doing it. So, um, what what I the most important thing for for me to impart is like there's many there's many other there's many spreadsheets or many tools and ways to do this. And you know if you have any questions around the best way to do it for your business, be always happy to answer any questions. Drop me a line anytime. Fantastic. Once again, we appreciate you joining us today. If you'd like to connect with us, you can either scan the QR code, it will take you right to our website, or use one of the other methods here, going to our site, sending us an email, or dropping us a line in social media. Uh, we're really grateful for the time that uh, 
you've spent with us today. Here's how you can get to Foresight. Again, we just showed you his website. You can also scan the code and, uh, and get there as well. So from Austin, Texas, Amy, thank you for coordinating this today. And uh, we welcome you guys. We hope to see you in our next upcoming webinar. By the way, this will be available on demand if you'd like to take a look at it in the future, along with a schedule of other online webinars and live stream events, including lunch and learns and other information that can help you as we try to simplify startup funding. So Ben, Taylor, Amy, thank you uh, for joining us today. And uh, we wish you well and a happy holiday coming soon. Thanks, everybody.